Welcome to the official ABA Law Student Podcast, where we talk about issues that affect law students and recent grads. From finals and graduation to the bar exam and finding a job, this show is your trusted resource for the next big step. You're listening to the Legal Talk Network. Hello and welcome to another edition of the ABA Law Student Podcast here on Legal Talk Network. I'm Chris Morgan, Governor of the ABA Law Student Division's 12th Circuit and a 3L at the Gonzaga University School of Law in Spokane. Our show today is sponsored by the American Bar Association's Law Student Division, and in this monthly podcast, we cover topics of interest to you, law students, and recent grads. We hope this show is a trusted resource for all of our listeners. For this show, F. Lee Bailey Jr. of Bailey and Elliott Consulting is our guest. Mr. Bailey is a graduate of the Boston University School of Law and has represented a number of notable clients over the years, including Sam Shepard, George Edgerly, and of course, O.J. Simpson. He's also authored a number of legal books and served his country as an officer in the United States Marine Corps. Welcome to the show, Mr. Bailey. Uh, We really appreciate you coming on to chat with us. Thank you. So to uh, help introduce you to our listeners, I want to start by talking just a little bit about kind of what drove you to pursue a career in the legal profession. So it sounds like you left Harvard to join the military and then decided to go to law school uh, after that. Well, (laughs) I'm sure it sounds that way, but that's not exactly true. I left Harvard because my grades weren't very good, and I thought the draft board was looking at me with great interest. And so rather than be drafted, I joined the Naval Flight Training Program in order to become a Navy pilot. Once I became a pilot, and I must point out that at Harvard, I was a major in English. I wanted to be a a journalist, and I wanted to write the great American novel. But once I was in the Marine Corps, they quickly ran out of lawyers. And one day, the commanding officer called me in and said, you're the new legal officer. I said, what are you talking about? I haven't finished college. I don't have any law school. He says, in the Marine Corps, the volunteer system is alphabetical, and you are the new legal officer. Here's a book, go read it, and you'll be in court next week. So I was a good officer. I obeyed orders. I read the book. I went in court. I prosecuted a guy, convicted him, felt so bad. I said, I won't be prosecuting anymore. I'll do defense cases. I developed an affinity and a taste for that kind of work. And when I was offered the chance to have a career in the Marine Corps, I said, no, no, I have to get out and go to law school because I'm going to be a good trial lawyer, but if I don't go to law school, they won't let me in the courtroom. That's how that evolved. So uh, then you go over to Boston U, and you graduate from law school there at Boston University. Did you open your own shop there in Boston, and and was it exclusively a criminal defense firm when you first started out? I opened a shop before I ever graduated. My attendance record at Boston U was, I think, the worst in the history of the school. (laughs) I had been thoroughly briefed by a number of very good trial lawyers that I'd met in the service that if I wanted to be a trial lawyer, law school wasn't going to be of much help. And that turned out to be true. So I cut lots of classes and went to court and sat with lawyers trying cases and watched them perform or fail to perform, which was the more common, and began to get a sense of what was needed. Meanwhile, I kept a very good uh, grade point average, and the dean used to call me in every now and then, said, your attendance is terrible. If you weren't the valedictorian, we'd throw you out. I said, I get that. So I continue to get good grades. All right. So I have to ask you about some of these high-profile cases that you've handled. One of your earlier cases, you defended Sam Shepard, who was a doctor accused of killing his wife. What was it like to defend a client all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court that early in your legal career? Well, the fact is I did not. Sam Shepard was tried and convicted in 1954. I was still flying jets all over the skies of North Carolina, burning up lots of government fuel, which was then very cheap. I got out, went to law school. I had, meanwhile, become one of the few lawyers in the country who developed 
an affinity for the polygraph, commonly known as the lie detector, mm -hmm. and got called into a capital case, I mean electric chair case, when I was one month by the bar to cross-examine a polygraph alleged expert. Actually, he was a phony. And I kind of tore him a new one in the courtroom. The defendant said, I like that. I want you to finish the case for me. I did. He was acquitted. And after that, my plans to become a personal injury lawyer were sidetracked. So the Sam Shepard case and the George Edgerly case uh, in Chicago were later adapted to be into what became The Fugitive, uh, with Harrison Ford and Tommy Lee Jones, I think, were in the movie, and then there was a, uh, a television series as well. What was it like to see cases that you've worked on in real life retold on the screen in that way? Well, it was very interesting. The case provided the theme for The Fugitive, and the idea, because frankly it was thought up by a friend of mine named Dan Malnick, but the series, The Fugitive, which starred David Jansen, I think ran three or four years, was aired before the second Shepherd trial in 1966 in Cleveland. And when I picked a jury with my counterpart, John Corrigan, for the prosecution, none of us asked any of the prospective jurors if they watched The Fugitive which I thought was good for me because everybody who watched The Fugitive knew that The Fugitive didn't do it. And if Sam Shepard was seen as The Fugitive, that was a good thing, putting a new jury in the box. And in fact, it worked out pretty well. He was acquitted after a very short deliberation. But in 1954, he'd been convicted and sentenced to life. I took the case seven years later. I got him out three years after that. He went to trial again two years after that, was acquitted, got his license back, and from there things kind of went downhill. Another past client of yours, Albert DeSalvo, has confessed to being the Boston Strangler, even though he was never actually prosecuted for those crimes. How positive are you that he was responsible for those murders? Well, I'm very positive, and so is everybody else connected with the case at this point, a cottage industry sprung up among writers who wanted to postulate that Albert was not the man. Mm -hmm. And the last of those who was the nephew of one of the victims and happened to work for CBS, and finally conceded after DNA tests were done that Albert was the man and the wannabes kind of went away. But the tragedy in the Salvo case is we didn't learn anything from it. Uh, right now, we don't learn anything from people that commit horrendous crimes. We either salt them away for life or execute them. But we're too, let's say, lazy to dig into that unpleasant area and try and improve the system that is supposed to profile and spot these characters before they become lethal. So you would suggest then, as an alternative to just putting them behind bars, expanding resources for mental health courts, or getting him into a place where doctors and you know psychologists could actually dig into what may have caused him or led him to that point, as opposed to just putting him behind bars? Um, that's a fair encapsulation of my views, I might say incidentally that although it's no longer in print, your listeners and viewers can get a copy of a book that sent many people to law school, I'm glad to say, called The Defense Never Rests, published in 1971. And it deals with the Shepard case and the DeSalvo case and some others, uh, but I hope it's informative. And in that book, you'll find a very strong plea and then a disappointment because the judge who heard the DeSalvo case ordered that he be given medical evaluation, and I mean extensive, not superficial, by right. the state, and the state simply ignored his order. So a couple decades later, 
uh, in your career, you received the call to be a part of the O.J. Simpson defense team. What were your initial thoughts after being asked to take part in that case? Was it clear from the beginning that you were asked to come on for a certain role, or was everyone kind of brought in and then the cross just became kind of your specialty niche within the group? No, if the truth be told, I was invited to come into the case because it had originally been in the hands of a very capable lawyer named Howard Weitzman, who had been O.J.'s attorney in another uh, much more minor matter. His civil lawyers, who didn't know what they were doing, fired Weitzman and hired Bob Shapiro because they thought Bob could make a deal to keep O.J. out of court. Bob was a friend of mine, and suddenly O.J. was getting offers from everybody in the country who had a name and who had some murder experience. Bob had never tried a murder case. Mm -hmm. He called me to join him to kind of fend off the hyenas knocking at the door, and I wound up with several assignments. One was total responsibility to prepare the case, and the other was to take Mark Furman apart because he was the only link between O.J. Simpson and the murders. So many credit your cross of Mark Furman as being one of the pivotal moments of that trial and being responsible, at least to some extent, for the ultimate resolution and Mr. Simpson's acquittal. Can you describe what it was like going into court to confront Mr. Furman that day? Yes, I had several things before me one of which is very unusual. Uh, Furman was a racist and an anti-Semite in equal doses of vitriol. But the jury was uh, mainly made up of minorities. I don't recall any Jewish people being on the juries. I had to get Mr. Furman to lie. And if he would lie about being a racist or uttering racist epithets as part of his daily vernacular, it then gave me the opportunity to tell the jury the old Latin maxim, falsus in unum, falsus in omnibus, which means if somebody lies about one thing, they probably lie about everything. And that's the way I went after Furman. He had been educated in special training sessions conducted in a grand jury room, not to say no if he was asked whether or not he used a racial epithet. And I knew I had to somehow get him into a frame of mind where he would ignore that advice and lie. And I did, and he lied. And at the time, I had no knowledge of them, but I did have a bucket full of witnesses who'd heard him use that language, who were ready to testify. And suddenly, uh, my chief investigator, Pat McKenna, uh, turned up with these audio tapes of Furman using that foul language every day of his life, at least as far as the tapes were concerned. Mm -hmm. But the only time in my life I saw the chief witness for the prosecution pleading guilty to perjury in open court during the trial. As you're watching it then, uh, I don't know how much of the series that you've seen over the last several months you were depicted by actor Daniel Lane in the FX series, at least. Did anyone from FX or did Daniel himself reach out to you prior to when that show began filming to kind of get your take on uh, on the case? No, none of them did, because each of the shows, very frankly, was slanted to slake the public thirst for more and more evidence that O.J. was guilty. And that has been the general trend, except among African Americans who take a different view almost ever since the verdict came in. He has learned more than any client I've ever had about the damnation of an acquittal. As to the three series that have aired so far, one had some very good acting in it, but the storyline was simply not true, not faithful to any of the real facts in the case. Nathan Lane, who played me, uh, did a great job, I thought, and pinpointed the high moment of Furman's cross-examination when I said to him, anybody who came to this courtroom has said you use that word would be a liar, wouldn't they? 
And he said, yes. And I said, all of them? And he looked and he realized that he'd been had, but he said yes. And so that opened the door for almost anything that contradicted him. But by and large, the most popular of the series that won all the awards made a fool out of Shapiro, a Harridan out of Sarah Paulson, who played the prosecutrix, uh, but she did a great job in acting. By and large, all the actors did a good job. They just weren't speaking the truth. Oddly enough, I spoke to Nathan Lane. I said, Nathan, why didn't you ever call me before you finished this thing? And he said, we were told not to. It was thought you were too sympathetic to the defense. That is not honest journalism by a long shot. So in real life, while you're in the in the middle of the case, aside from all the dramatizations and and everything that's gone on in the years since, what was it like working with so many big personalities on the defense team? It sounds like you and Shapiro may have had somewhat of a falling out over the last couple of decades. Uh, Bob and I had a total falling out in that case because I found out he had signed a document that charged O.J. $1 million for his defense and asserted that Shapiro would provide my services as part of the contract. He did not notify me of that. When I found it out by accident, he told me, oh, you're just a volunteer. And he had lost control of the case to Johnny Cochran anyway. And uh, so I would say that effectively ended any friendship we might have had. Is it true that um, while we're getting to the last couple of weeks of the trial, before the jury goes out for deliberations, it's been said that prison guards were actually getting autographs from O.J. while he was still incarcerated? To your knowledge, is that accurate? It is, but it wasn't two weeks before the end of the trial. I'll tell you exactly how I learned of that because it's a very poignant moment. When the jury announced it had a verdict, Johnny Cochran was up in wine country. So the judge postponed the opening of the envelope with the verdicts, two verdicts, in it until the following morning at 10 o'clock. Johnny came running back from Napa Valley. OJ's secretary called me and said, would you go down and assure OJ that you think everything's going to be all right? As a lot of people were saying, including Shapiro, he's going to be convicted. And uh, she said, OJ will be comforted because he respects what you tell him. So I went down to the jail and was confronted by NBC on the steps. And they said, how come you're so confident you've got an acquittal? I said, because I've been around the system longer than anybody else in the case. I've seen two signals and I know that they may not guilty. I walked into the jail, met O.J., who was beaming from ear to ear, and I said, O.J., you've got an acquittal out there, but you seem to know that without any advice from me. Why is that? He said, because every guard in this jail has asked me for an autograph and let me know that it would be their last chance. Now, that's kind of a clue. So the two signals that you just mentioned that made you think before the verdict was read that O.J. was going to be acquitted, were those signals general principles of trial and trial work that you picked up along the way, or were they two particular signals, if you don't mind sharing with us, that kind of pushed you that direction? No, I'm happy to share them with you because I think they are very useful to those who will practice law in the aftermath of my career. The first was that the jury had been sitting there for nine months. I predicted they'd get a verdict in one day and everybody thought I was a hopeless radical. They came in the first morning that they were allowed to talk about the case. The case went to them on a Friday. Judge Ito was too busy to let them deliberate on the weekend despite the fact that they were locked up. So the first morning, mid-morning, I was giving a speech in Redondo Beach And the lawyer who had the duty, Carl Douglas, called me on the phone. He said, Lee, what do I do? The jury has a question. I said, what's the question? 
they want to know if the limo driver saw OJ in his headlights that night after he parked in front of the gate. I said, fine, make sure they read all his testimony and just not some snippet. So the judge ordered, they listened to all the testimony. They got to the point in the driver's testimony from the transcript, Alan Park, where he was asked, did you see anyone walk through the headlights while you were sitting there? He said, no, I never did. And I was watching closely, hoping somebody would let me in the gate. At that point, the jurors got up and walked out. They had no permission from the judge. They uh, obviously had been in there to convince one juror that her recollection was bad, theirs was good. Much more important, within three minutes, they asked for the verdict forms. The verdict forms as to both Nicole and Ronald Goldman had guilty, guilty of second degree murder, and not guilty. Within eight minutes, the forms were returned to the clerk. That's enough time for 12 people to agree and the paperwork to get done to click not guilty on both. And that's all the time there was. So those two signals told me beyond doubt that they had voted to acquit OJ on both counts. His source, of course, was equally reliable because the guards always know what the verdict is the minute it's agreed upon. And they were the ones telling OJ, you're going home, man. Wow. Okay, so we've had we've had Marsha Clark and Carl Douglas both on the show uh, in the last several months, and uh, I have to ask this question because I really do think, you know, generally the American public tends to struggle with a misunderstanding of the burden of proof and what exactly proof beyond a reasonable doubt means. There's not necessarily a an innocent verdict; it's either guilty or not guilty. So, as Part one of this question, I guess, what is your definition of proof beyond a reasonable doubt? And two, do you think then that the jury got it right here in this case? Well, let me do the second question first. Okay. The jury got it right, and they still think that they got it right, and they have said so recently during interviews, some of which were triggered by the TV programs that were aired in 2016. I have struggled throughout my career to deal with reasonable doubt in a way that laymen would understand, because jurors are almost always laymen, although occasionally a lawyer finds his way into the jury panel. I've heard it defined by judges, lawyers, scholars, and others across the country. At the end of the day, all we know is that there are several levels of proof necessary in the legal process. First is a colorable case. If you file a complaint in civil court, your case better be colorable. That is, appear to have some merit or it goes out. The second is the burden of proof in a civil case, a preponderance of the evidence, which translated means a probability that one side is more likely to be correct than the other. Next, which is used in fraud cases and other cases of Some gravity is clear and convincing evidence, which means you should be quite sure that this guy is wrong before you condemn him. And the highest level between clear and convincing and absolute certainty, which is an an elusive standard we will probably never reach, is beyond a reasonable doubt. I have always defined that to juries as a doubt that has any reason behind it, and that you suspect might keep you awake nights in the future if you ignore it now and it comes back to remind you later that you ignored it. If a lawyer can effectively get a jury to follow the reasonable doubt standard to follow it, he'll win most of his cases. Incidentally, not as the throwaway, But because I was trained in the military, I have a strong affinity for their system of justice. Military officers who comprise almost all military juries, except for a few where enlisted men are invited and do participate, military officers are disciplined to follow orders. Reasonable doubt 
means you must quit people you think really did it because you have a doubt. It's a tough standard. Military juries generally do follow it. Civilian juries really don't. Thanks. So bringing the the discussion back to law students who are in school right now and even young attorneys who have recently graduated and are out in the real world, what advice, if any, would you give to those who aspire one day to be high-quality defense attorneys? Well, I don't have any advice for those who are interested only in being defense attorneys, but for anyone who wants to be a trial lawyer, which in my view is the most important group of any in the bar, because at the end of the day, when all stops are out and all else has failed, you have to go to court. And when you go to court, if you have a good trial lawyer, your chances of winning are greatly improved. If you have a bad trial lawyer, you could be as innocent as Snow White and still lose. I therefore think that that fast fading cadre of specialists needs to be revivified and shored up. I have two books that I would strongly encourage any aspirants who may want to be trial lawyers, and you have to give this decision a lot of thought to look at. One is the one I wrote in 71 called The Defense Never Rest. It was a bestseller. It is still fairly widely read. The other is a recent book called The Excellence in Cross-Examination, and that was published by West three years ago. It is gradually making inroads through a small segment of the profession. But if you want to be a trial lawyer or think that you might, I would strongly encourage you to take a look at the first book and to look very carefully at the second one. It will tell you what kind of life you are inviting to dominate the rest of your life. Prefacing a little bit of of your second book there, The Excellence in Cross-Examination, obviously you're one of the leading authorities in that topic, you know, both from an academic standpoint and a practical standpoint. What, in your opinion, if you could share just a couple of thoughts, what makes a great cross-examination? What is it that you're trying to do aside from just discredit the witness? Yeah, I think that that is such an individualized case-by-case situation that no answer is meaningful. And much better uh, is that I should tell you what I think makes a great cross-examiner. First of all, you have to be that kind of person, and thank God America breeds new ones every day. That has what I call CD2, confidence, discipline, and determination. Confidence is the belief that when you get up to speak to somebody, whether it be a jury or a crowd, they're there because they want to hear what you have to say. And you should be confident about what you have to say if it's of anything important. Now, there are phonies all over the world who make statements they don't mean or don't know much about. That's not what I have in mind. I'm talking about confidence justified by who you are and what topic you are trying to bring enlightenment to. Discipline means doing things on a regular basis. In other words, you have to, like going to the gym, do so many reps before the muscles that you're trying to train and strengthen get the message. Determination is the big item for a trial lawyer. Like a sailboat, you have to be able to take a knockdown and come back up again because Particularly if you're defending, you're going to get knocked down a lot. Most criminal defendants have done something. Most juries think criminal defendants are in court because they've done something. So despite all the lofty standards, presumption of innocence, burden of proof, beyond a reasonable doubt, make no mistake, you have a laboring or from day one. Unless you have the ability to master the king's English and persuade as you speak a memory like a hawk or maybe a whole den of hawks and the determination to keep trying until you win. Sam Shepard lost 11 appeals. I lost the 11th before I got him out. Then we lost another appeal. 
then the U.S. Supreme Court turned about right side up again. Those are some of the ingredients that you'd better have and thrive upon. Otherwise, my advice is stay out of the trial court. You'll have a nervous breakdown before you're 40. Is there uh, a moment during a case or just a case in and of itself that stands out to you? Obviously, you've had a very long, illustrious career. Is there a favorite moment of those for you? Um, I think there is. It is the ultimate bounty of a well-structured and well-orchestrated and well-delivered cross-examination. It occurred in a civil case. It was a lawsuit by a finder, someone who finds deals against Raytheon Company, one of the titans of American industry, over the sale of an aircraft company called Beechcraft, which Raytheon bought. This fellow claimed that he had brought it to their attention, worked to get them the deal, and then they ignored him and hired someone else. So I took over the lawsuit for a woman, very distinguished criminal lawyer who became a federal judge who had been kicked out by the trial judge for talking to jurors before the trial, jurors from a prior proceeding. And so I took it over and the president of Raytheon was my chief witness. And at the end of the cross-examination, I said to him, Mr. Phillips, after all that you've told us, wouldn't you say that your company owes my client some money? And he said it would appear that way. I've never gotten that lucky since. <laughs> Thanks for that. So before we finish up here, uh, I have one last question. Just for our listeners who might want to follow up with you, how are they able to reach out to you either on social media, email, or otherwise? Uh, how might they be able to get a hold of you? I don't do any social media. I have an email address. It is bail Elliot at Gmail. Bail Elliot is B-A-I-L-E-L-L-I-O-T-T at gmail.com. But an easy avenue into that is the website, Bailey and Elliot, no punctuation, dot com. And appended to that website is a 50-page document explaining to all of you, but more importantly to your parents, who are probably dead wrong in this issue, why O.J. Simpson didn't and couldn't have murdered his wife. All right, perfect. Just want to thank you again, Mr. Bailey, for taking the time to join us here today. I really appreciate it. Anything to help young lawyers. Hey, we appreciate that. Well, uh, we hope you've enjoyed another episode of our show here on Legal Talk Network. We encourage you to subscribe to the ABA Law Student Podcast on iTunes so that you don't miss an episode. Also, take time to rate and review us as well. You can reach us on Twitter at ABALSD using the hashtag Law Student Podcast. I'm Chris Morgan, and thank you again for listening to the ABA Law Student Podcast here on Legal Talk Network. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS, find us on Twitter and Facebook, or download our free Legal Talk Network app in Google Play and iTunes. Remember, U.S. law students at ABA-accredited schools can join the ABA for free. Join now at AmericanBar.org forward slash law student. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.